Now, uh, tonight is about pilgrimage. Now, as Buddhists, we know that we have four holy places. Uh, Lumbini was where the, where the Buddha was born. Budgaya was where the Buddha was enlightened. Sarana, where he preached the first sermon. And Kushinara, where he finally passed away. We almost take it for granted. We know that these places are in India. And, uh, you know, we go for pilgrimage. And I myself have led uh, groups to pilgrimage. But what might surprise you is that if not for the accounts of the two Chinese monks, whose name is Fa Xian and Xuan Zhang, the Buddhists will have no holy places to visit in India. It's because of the records from these monks that we now have places to visit for pilgrimage, right? So we must really thank Venerable Fa Xian and uh, Venerable Xuan Zhang. Now, who was Fa Xian? Fa Xian lived in the fifth century. He was a Chinese Buddhist monk and a translator, and he traveled on his way to India, he went by foot from India to uh, from China to India using the Silk Road. Uh, but when he returned back to China, he went by sea. And so it's overland and coming back by sea. And he visited many sacred sites in Central Asia, in the Indian subcontinent, and on his way back also visited Southeast Asia. And uh, he's, he's, uh, he spent uh, from 399 to 412 Christian era. Uh, so 14 years in his journeys in order to, to collect the Buddhist uh, scriptures. Now he was more interested in the Vinaya Pitaka. So he was collecting the rules of discipline along the journey. And he spent two years in Sri Lanka and on his way back to China, the ship went into a, hit into a storm and I think he landed up in, in, in Java and which he spent about uh, a few months, five months. And then he sailed back to China, again hit by a storm and uh, they went off course again in China, but he landed up in China and he wrote a record called A Record of Buddhist Kingdoms. And that also become a very important resource for us. And he was like two centuries before Xuan Zhang. Xuan Zhang was the seventh century. He was a scholar, pilgrim monk who traveled from China to India and back. He was the one who used the Silk Road, journey to, to India and back using the Silk Road. And wow, if you have ever traveled under the Silk Road, you know how dangerous it is traveling to the Silk Road. He went over to, uh, again, like uh, Fashian, to uh, Nalanda in order to clarify his understanding of the Yoga Chara school. Nobody in China could answer his questions. So he had to go to Nalanda to see the, uh, the most illustrious teacher, Sila Bhadra, uh, for clarification, right? And um, so, um, when, when, when he was there, he also took the opportunity to travel throughout India, where he made very detailed accounts of what he saw, places that was connected with the Buddha. And uh, Xuan Zhang was, uh, was in Nalanda, uh, uh, well, 500 years later after Xuan Zhang, Buddhism disappeared from India. And it disappeared for seven centuries, that people even forgot who the Buddha was. The Buddha was just, uh, a reincarnation of Vishnu. And the holy places, the places, the temples, the monasteries were completely left abundant. Some of them, you, know, you have Shiva temple built a bit on them. So they are completely forgotten for 700 years. So it was because of the record of Xuan Zhang that we now have it, right? Of course, those who have traveled the, the Silk Road, it's a very dangerous route crossing through deserts and through, uh, through uh, snowy mountain paths. And also you have these uh, nomadic tribes that attack caravans, kill the people, kill the people in the caravan in order to take whatever they could, you know, they stole things. So uh, Xuan Zhang spent 17 years in his journey and he wrote the great Tao record of the Western region. He wrote this for the emperor, Taizong, who was the emperor of the Tang Dynasty. And this is considered to be one of the four great classics in Chinese literature. And it's because of the detailed accounts of Xuan Zhang that we actually knew what it was like, uh, you know, in the seventh century in Central Asia, all the way to India and back. So we are really indebted to Xuan Zhang. He collected 657 Sanskrit texts and spent his time in Xi'an with a translation bureau and translated. Now, after a while, he actually converted Taizong, the emperor, the Tang emperor. Tang emperor became his friend and he became almost a counselor for the Tang Emperor. And the Tang Emperor supported him. So all the translators were printed 
and were disseminated, was distributed throughout the country. And the emperor allowed the ordination of 17,000 monks. And this was a period during the Tang Dynasty that the Buddhism in China rose to the apex. It, Buddhism blossomed during the Tang Dynasty and reached the apex and never again was Buddhism like that in China. So we have to pay our tribute to Xuan Zhang for his contributions. Yeah? And uh, a few decades after Xuan Zhang, you have another famous uh, pilgrim monk, his name is Yi Jing. Uh, he traveled by sea this time to India and back from India by sea because the sea route could not be used anymore. And he traveled to India 23 years after Sun Chang passed away. So he admired Sun Chang and Fa Chang very much. And uh, then the, the good thing is that he traveled to our part of the world and he wrote very detailed accounts of what Buddhism, the Buddhist practice of Buddhism in Indonesia and in the Malay Peninsula. So Buddhism was practiced in this part of the world. And it was recorded by uh, Yi Jing. Okay, now uh, uh, now to our speaker tonight, uh, uh, Deepak Anand, and I had the pleasure of meeting our speaker during my trips to India on pilgrimage and also my association with the International Buddhist Confederation. I met him a couple of times, but the latest was when I bumped into him at the Bodhi Tree in Mahabodhi last year when I led a group of pilgrimage. And he was there, we say, hey, are you Dr. Lee? <laughs> and they were, oh, that's Deepak. <laughs> he was seated under the body tree with his computer, with his laptop. And he says, I must talk to you about this project that I'm on. So then we connected again. Let me just give a profile for our speaker. Now the speaker is actually speaking from Sravasti in India. He was on a kind of a working tour, following the footsteps of Sun Zhang. And uh, last night, I think, yesterday he was at Sravasti. And so he's going to speak from Sravasti. And of course, this journey was interrupted somewhat by the lockdown in India. And once the lockdown was over, he was able to walk and arrive at Sravasti for, us, for him to give a talk. And when we listen to Sravasti, we know that that was the favorite place for the Buddha because the Buddha spent 25 rainy seasons in Sravasti, 19 of which was spent in Jetapanagro, Sravasti. So that's where Deepak is speaking from. Now Deepak uh, is called, he called himself uh, the Buddhist pilgrimage explorer. And of course, he's a writer, very passionate about the revival of the ancient Buddhist pilgrimage in India. And he received his bachelor's of engineering at the Shanti Lal Shah College of Engineering in Gujarat and his MBA at the Punjab University. And he has published a few books on the Buddhist uh, heritage and two books on Swenzang. One is called Swenzang, Footsteps That Time Cannot Erase, and the second book, The Pilgrimage Legacy of Sun Zhang. And this was actually now on exhibition, the contents are and on exhibition at the Sun Zhang Memorial in Nalanda. And he has so far walked 750 kilometers to trace the Sun Zhang roots in India, because remember, 700 years, Buddhism completely disappeared from India. So Deepak followed Sun Zhang's records, go to these places and tell the villagers, do you know that this is where the Buddha was? And to their surprise, they say, really? Really, we didn't know that. Yeah. So it's very interesting. And uh, so, uh, uh, well, um, uh, I will uh, just in a, in a minute invite uh, Deepak to speak to us, but I must remind you, I encourage you, please click like at the Facebook, like, 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 and also give your comments. And you can type in your questions and uh, the questions will be beamed and uh, then the, given the right opportunity, Deepak will be able to respond to your questions, okay? So with that introduction, after setting the scene, can we please invite Deepak? Deepak, or, uh, you know, can you please uh, you can uh, speak you, yeah. uh, I'm really very honored to uh, talk about uh, Master Shwenzang and this food journey that I'm doing. And uh, as you were rightly, I mean, talking about uh, Shwenzang and his great contributions. And uh, as I was walking this trail, I met many people. And I was surprised that uh, people, although, I mean, many people, they know about Buddha. Almost there are only few people who were ignorant about Buddha. But I found many people who, had, who, who knew even about Shwenzang. So, but uh, for them, I mean, he's just a traveler who just came to India. They do not know the depth of his contribution, the immense contribution that he has done in his book, uh, which has led to discovery of the footsteps of the Buddha. So this uh, food journey that I'm doing is basically a tribute to this extraordinary man for his contribution. And also because the present pilgrimage in India, the footsteps of the Buddha, 
it's very limited. Like, you know, it's not in totality as which Shenzhen himself experienced. And as you rightly said about Faxian, Faxian was like, you know, Shenzhen was inspired by Faxian's uh, travelogue. When Shenzhen was there in China, uh, as you rightly said, he was not very happy with the Buddhist texts that were available in China at that time. He could understand that these teachings of the Buddha are very good and it would be very useful for Chinese, for China. But then he noticed that all this translation, because all these texts are translated from Sanskrit to Chinese, and I mean, they are retranslated and retranslated. So in the process, he noticed that it has lost the essence. So he came to know that uh, if somehow he could manage to get a original text copy of, of uh, Yogachari Bhumi, uh, Bhumi Sastra, so then th that could be helpful for him so that, I mean, he could himself translate those texts into Chinese and that would be helpful in, uh, what do you say, uh, promoting the teachings of Buddha in China. So in the process, he met his Indian monk. He was, after, uh, after the age of 17, he was already a very prominent monk. He was a child prodigy. And at the age of uh, nine, he left his home. He joined monastery with his uh, elder brother. At the age of 13, he joined a very good monastery in Luang. And then uh, at the age of 17 and 18, he was a very celebrated monk. He, he was like, you know, master of sastras. And he would go from one monastery to other in Chinese cities, in Chinese uh, uh, monasteries. And then he was not satisfied with like, you know, the interpretation of all the texts that were available at that time in China. So he met a person, a, a visiting monk from India who suggested him to go to Nalanda. And that quickly, you know, immediately he, he got this idea that I, I have to go, I have to leave. And then, because I mean, at that time, as you said, uh, tanking was, uh, Taizong became immediately at that time, and nobody was allowed to leave the country. Although he applied for uh, permission thrice, he was denied. So he decided to sneak out of uh, China. And ultimately, after traveling four or five years through the Silk Route, facing all those dangers that you said, I mean, traveling in Silk Route is like, you know, you are facing death every day. I mean, like, you know, it's so much of, I mean, Shenzhen himself faced so many near death situations, all those rob robbers and bandits, they, he would always like, you know, listen to the stories how in the previous night, the bandits, they attacked the previous group which uh, crossed the uh, cities. So Shenzhen was like, you know, once, uh, and every time, you know, when, uh, besides collecting the text, he was also interested in, uh, because I mean, this would also give him opportunity to visit all those places which he was uh, reading in the text. So every time, like in, uh, he would stay at some place. So like King of uh, uh, King of uh, Kucha, or uh, they, they they try to stop him. They said that why don't you why you go to India? We'll make you the chief monk, chief priest here. But Shenzhen would always say that no, I have to go to Vulture's Peak. I have to bend my legs there. Similarly, when he was at uh, in Kazakhstan, present day Kazakhstan, the king, the Khan, the great Khan. He said, why are you going to India? It's such a hot country. There's nothing like winter. I mean, there's hot or very hot. And you are such a handsome man. Your face will melt there. So in spite of all these obstacles and hurdles, he still, he, after six years, he came to Nalanda. And then that meeting with the Srila Bhadra was uh, like, you know, a great meeting uh, between both of them. About why we are doing this walk why, why we are talking about retracing the Shenzhen. Uh, I would like to give a small background, uh, like, you know, on the presentation uh, slides, that why this uh, Shenzhen is so relevant. He is not just an ordinary traveler, but he is a great guy. And his uh, travelogues played, played, I mean, like, you know, single-handedly, it led to rediscovery of the footsteps of the Buddha. Like all the Buddhist texts, they talk about the wandering of the Buddha. They talk about events of the Buddha. But all these texts, Pali texts, Lalit Vistra, Abhishraman Sutra, uh, all these text, biographical texts of Buddha, they talk about events, they talk about places, but that whole geography is floating. Only Shenzhen gives ground, the entire geography. I mean, if you translate Shenzhen travelogue right from Xi'an, you can reach Bodh Gaya, just translating distance and direction. It's so accurate and so meticulously done. So uh, Shenzhen was like, you know, uh, his travelogues were so important that uh, uh, when Buddhism was lost in India, when this translate, this uh, travelogues were translated. Can I get the slides? Can I can I see the slides?
नेक्स्ट स्लाइड सो दिस इज मैप ऑफ इंडिया एंड यू कैन सी दिस इज लुम्बिनी नेपाल प्रेजेंट इन नेपाल दिस इज बुद्धा वॉज बॉर्न एंड दिस इज महापरनिर्वाणा Buddhism was limited to like you know few places in Gangetic Plain. It was only when Emperor Ashoka he took interest in Buddhism, he became uh, uh, he he got interested into Buddhism. He became he he practiced Buddhism, and then he was so fascinated by it that he started he thought of uh, like you know taking it to all over the world so that everybody is benefited. So he worked. he sent dhamma dutas to everywhere i mean at that time all the known world at that time he sent dhamma dutas and dhamma missions to all the countries to so that i mean people all over the world they get benefited from uh, the teachings of the buddha so next slide so intervention of ashoka it led to like you know expansion of buddhism so in the next uh, and ashoka also marked all the places of the buddha with stupa pillars and chetyas viharas monasteries everywhere like you know he marked all the places of uh, footsteps of the buddha with stupas and pillars and this example of ashoka was uh, taken by the subsequent kings and dynasties so this led to expansion of buddhism and in subsequent centuries buddhism went from india to china from china to korea in 4th century in 6th century see it went to japan and from india it went to sri lanka in 3rd bc because of emperor ashoka and from there it went to myanmar thailand cambodia so and subsequently buddhism like you know it divided into three uh, types like mahayana theravada and vajrayana so this is like you know how buddhism flourished and it went into all these countries next and uh, next slide please so and then the, uh, this uh, buddhism took proper roots in all this country it became part of the culture of this country so but what happened in india the political climate in 11 12th century it started deteriorating it was not favorable for flourishing of buddhist monastery so slowly gradually what happened buddhism started declining and uh, by 13th century buddhism was totally lost in indian subcontinent but fortunately buddhism had already taken roots in other countries neighboring asian countries so and all the buddhist monasteries and buddhist sites it became ruins it it was neglected for century it became ruins and it got converted into mounds and the new population which came and settled over all these mounds next slide so the new population which came and settled on all these sites so this places got new names like nalanda university it became badgaon uh, uruvela and mahabodhi became bodhgaya shravasti became sahit mahet uh, kushia became kushinagar became kasia uh, similarly vaishali became kolua so all these sites got renamed i mean they assume new names and nothing was left even you know when britishers when they came here so they saw this images of buddha scattered everywhere in this subcontinent so they got confused because they thought this this curly hair and long ear lobes and protruded lip so they thought this these are some images of some deity who belongs to africa so they thought this buddha the shakya uh, he must be some african king or african god who came into india and established his like you know religion so this theory got very popular and this is the image of mahabodhi temple it, it was totally neglected for 400 years 500 years and it became a like you know a board of a uh, mahant and all these images of buddha it got new names people started worshiping buddha images with new names like you know batu bhairav uh, rukmani devi so nobody knew this images of buddha with buddha's name it had all new names so this was very difficult task for uh, britishers to know how i mean uh, what this because whole of the india was littered with this images everywhere you go in indian subcontinent you would find images of buddha in afghanistan pakistan india everywhere so 
next slide so this was uh, and then then what happened this hello yeah so then what happened this british people colonial people in nepal in sri lanka in myanmar they started taking interest in their religion so uh, in the process they learned the local language they started translating their their their, their uh, religious text and they discovered there is a connection between all this religion of nepal sri lanka burma thailand all these countries and slowly after translating all this text like you know uh, when they translated uh, this text they realized that uh, buddhism has got indian origin this buddha was born somewhere in india this kapilavastu lumbini bodhgaya all these places were somewhere in india so but still this geography was not uh, confirmed where this all these places lie and uh, in 1833 1836 the travel accounts of fashians were uh, fashian were translated first time so when this uh, uh, fashian uh, text was translated for the first time uh, the copies came to india so this people they realized that fashian is basically talking about a footsteps of the buddha pilgrimage which he himself has walked but this fashian text was not very like you know comprehensible his uh, his uh, distance and directions were not very consistent because fashian when he came to india when he left china he was already 61 year old he was a old and fragile person his determination was extraordinary but uh, he, he his sense of distance and directions were not very consistent but still they could be on the basis of fashian text still they could identify few places like sarnath and sankisa but still the larger geography of footsteps of the buddha was still not uh, there and then in the meantime they also discovered the shenzang's uh, manuscript of shenzang's uh, book the uh, uh, shu shu hichi so but i mean this text was so detailed that it took almost 20 years to translate it they got the manuscript in 1836 and it took almost 20 years to translate those texts so when this text came so all the indian officers military officers bureaucrats they got this copy and they all of them they became explorers they wanted to like you know uh, because they knew that this is next big thing so and all of them they many of them they had this copies of uh, shenzang book and they were into into discovering the places but it was such a difficult task because the geography geography was not same the names of the places had changed and at that time in india even the maps were not very accurate especially the gangetic plain the in 1840s 50s 60s the maps were not very accurate they were not complete even i mean that is the reason in spite of uh, the travelogs of shenzang it came to india in 1850s but still it took like you know 30 40 50 years to identify the places next slide so shenzang this is like you know shenzang's uh, travel and With other accounts, you know, Pali literature. So this is the sublime wandering of the Buddha. This is the place where Buddha made his wandering. And it, on the basis of Shenzang, the eight great places of pilgrimage, like Shankarsya, Shravasti, Lumbini, Kushinagar, Vaishali, Rajgir, Bodhgaya, and Sarna, these places were identified. But uh, the idea of doing this walk, why uh, we are doing this uh, this project, retracing Bodhisattva Shenzang, because the idea is like you know. the pilgrimage is presently limited to only these eight great places but uh, shenzang he talks about a very elaborate buddhist pilgrimage he mentions about all those he walked if you if you next slide please yeah thank you so this is this this is uh, this is the detailed uh, not very detailed but like you know detailed travel of shenzang in the gangetic plain you can see he has given so much of description about the wandering of the buddha he, you can yourself see his journey from shug he went to haridwar from brahmanapura so all these places which he goes he he speaks about uh, the places where ashoka emperor ashoka marked the places where buddha gave his talks so all these places are there many of these places have been identified by british explorers and then later by archaeological survey of india but uh, all these places are in a very sad situation most of this many people even the people who are living there they do not know the significance of those places like you know so the idea of this walk is to incorporate to visit all these places 
and uh, corroborate with what Shrinidang has seen at those places and then what Cunningham has identified and what is the current situation of those places? What is like, you know, present situation 150 years after Cunningham, uh, Sir Alexander Cunningham, who made the first identifications, who offered the first identification of the places mentioned by Shrenzan. So the idea is also to document what uh, Cunningham uh, saw, what he has reported, and what is the present situation of those places. So I started my walk from Shug. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that slide of my walk, but I mean, you can see this whole description zone. So at all these places, this is like, you know, he went crisscross, uh, this, this is river Ganges, this is river Yamuna. So he crisscrossed this uh, landscape of Gangetic Plain, just touching the places where Buddha gave his talks, the places where Buddha made his wandering. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the map of the walk which I'm taking. So you can see this green line. This green line is the track which I'm going to walk. So I started from Shug. I came to, uh, I came to, I, I came to, I'm at Shravasti. I, I visited Sankisa, Virasna. All these places are the places which is mentioned by Shrenzang is the, as the place uh, where uh, Buddha made his wandering. So, uh, like you know at Shug. So this is Kuru Empire, ancient Kuru Empire. Kuru Empire is the place where Buddha gave very important talks like Mahasatipathan Sut. And still everybody knows about Kuru. Everybody knows about Mahasatipathan Sut. But this place is totally neglected. Nobody goes in Kuru. Hardly one or two or five people each year they go. And still there's some confusion about where is the exact place where Buddha gave Mahasatipathan Sut. So Shwenzang has offered some like clues uh, some clue to us uh, of the possible tentative place uh, where Buddha could have given, like, you know, uh, where Buddha gave Mahasati Pathan Sut. So I started my walk from Adi Badri. So this, 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 there's a cluster of uh, lots of uh, uh, Buddhist sites at this site. So I started walk from Adi Badri and from here I went to Chaneti and then Shug. So this place is, and then Topra. So the, Topra is the place where there was Ashokan pillar. So there was a king in 14th century called Muhammad bin Tughlaq, Firoshat Tug, uh, Firosha Tughlaq. So he removed this Ashokan pillar and he took this Ashokan pillar to New Delhi. So this site is still there. So the idea is uh, to incorporate all these places into Buddhist pilgrimage because this is the place where Buddha made his wandering according to uh, Shrenzang. And from here, I, I, I'm coming back to here. I mean, uh, I have put already put the stories of my visit to this place. You can find the stories on my blog. You can, if you are on Facebook, we have a dedicated page for this uh, retracing Bodhisattva Shrenzan's walk. And if you go on that page, on this Facebook page, you will find the stories of uh, my visit to Adi Badri, uh, Topra, the Ashokan Pillar site, and Shug. And Shug is such an interesting site, you know, that Ashokan. Uh, I, I will come to this in detail uh, in the later slides. And then from here, I, I visited Meerut. Meerut is also another site where there was an Ashokan pillar. So again, the same king, he removed this Ashokan pillar from here to New Delhi. So these two were removed. And we know that Ashoka put these pillars at those sites which were very important, very significant, very uh, significant for uh, like, you know, Buddhism. So my guess is that uh, Mera is also the place where Buddha made his wandering because we know that Buddha, Buddha was like you know, a very frequent visitor in Kuru and Panchala also because he would always travel from, uh, mostly travel from Shravasti to this land. So he would always cross Panchala for going to Kuru. So no wonder that there is a Shokan pillar, there was an Ashokan pillar at Mera. But now nobody knows in Mera that Mera had a Ashokan pillar. And, uh, but uh, for us, for all, uh, all of us who are like, you know, followers of teachings of the Buddha, who are appreciator of the Buddha, for us, these places are very significant and sanctity of all these places had to be, needs to be revitalized. And from Meerut, I came to Virasana. So this is another very interesting place. And Shrenzang visited this place. Uh, and he says he saw an Ashokan Stupa at their place where he gave talks. And uh, he's, and Pali literature also mentions about this place. And according to Pali literature, Buddha did one of his rainy seasons here. 
and when i visited this place there was a big mound there's a big mound and there are some local people there who are very like you know they, they are aware about this fact that this place was visited by master shenzang this place is uh, is an important site of uh, trouble and wandering of the buddha so there are some guys local people who are working towards uh, revitalization revitalization of the place they are like you know uh, taking proper care of the place so i have put that story on my blog and you can see that story on uh, my blog about this uh, virasna uh, and from there i went to sankisa i would be sharing all this in the next slide and from there i came to shravasti so idea behind this uh, retracing bodhisattva friends and project is the idea is also to reestablish this ancient walking trails you can see this is straight line <coughs> sorry so the idea is also because i'm every day i'm walking like 25 to 30 kilometers <coughs> and i'm trying to find a place to stay so that in future if somebody wants to do this walking pilgrimage from sankisa to shravasti he can go to, he can <coughs> he can stay at all those places and uh, like you know so that we can revitalize this ancient tradition of walking pilgrimage so the idea is also uh, through this retracing bodhisattva shrine project is to reestablish the walking pilgrimage trail <coughs> from shravasti i would be going to uh, nepal but uh, i had uh, talked with uh, the people who are coordinating my visit to nepal and they said that nepal is currently in totally lockdown so my visit won't be possible so instead i would be going to piprava the place where uh, relics of buddha were discovered in 18 uh, 1898 and later in 18, 1975 there were two excavations at, at piprava and, and both the excavations lots of buddha relics body relics were discovered so from sravasti i would be going to piprava and i would i will not enter nepal now i will do this part later on and from here i will go to rampurwa indian this this there are other two ashokan pillar pillars lying here and then from here i will go to vaishali and then from vaishali i will go to sarnath so basically i am following the shrenzang route and uh, there are some parts like you know uh, there there are few places which i am not being able to cover in this walk so i would be doing another walk to cover the left a few places like you know shrenzang also talks about kosam he talks about kannauj he talks about akichetra ayodhya so these are the places of buddha's wandering so i would be doing a second part of this retracing bodhisattva shrenzang and connecting all this leftover places and uh, doing this complete uh, because we know that buddha made his wandering in all this kingdom these are the kingdom this is kuru kingdom this is panchala this is kaushala this is uh, vamsha this is uh, kashi this is magadha this is vajji buddha the pali literature talks about buddha stay at all these places so uh, it's uh, like you know but it is only shrenzang he, he talks about the exact place where buddha made his wandering so shrenzang's accounts are very very crucial very important and based on shrenzang accounts there are only 22 or 23 places where buddha made his wandering so of this 22 places uh, almost like you know 18 to 19 places have correct identifications offered by sir alexander cunningham and by later explorers but these places are not uh, part of uh, uh, buddhist pilgrimage so uh, the idea is to like you know to share with the people about all these places to uh, generate awareness about this lesser known places because this there are only buddha is so great i mean there are followers of the buddha all over the world and there we have only 22 places where buddha made uh, his wandering which we are aware of like he made his wandering at he must have walked so there must be many places where he went where he stayed but shrenzang has given Uh, because there there are no other text which talks about the geography it's only shrenzang and shrenzang talks about only 22 places which he visited where he saw the stupas to mark the presence of buddha so the idea behind this walk is to follow the footsteps of the buddha based on shrenzang's account and revitalize because this revitalization would take i mean many many years many decades because we know this all these places were discovered in 1850s and we are already like 150 years 
after that and still uh, these places are uh, neglected and you can see uh, my stories on all the sites which i have visited like you know shug and all so these places are still like you know neglected as it was discovered i mean sometimes the situation is more bad next slide please next slide yeah so this is uh, chaniti and chaniti is in uh, it is close to shog it is in ancient kuru and uh, i visited this stupa so this stupa is like you know uh, this stupa is uh, in the previous previous slide previous previous slide yeah so you can see this stupa this stupa you can see that there are people living around this stupa and i met a not next next so i met a uh, few people there who are aware about this uh, importance of this site and they are working towards revitalization of uh, the sites in kuru i met a guy called siddharth and he is working very hard very like you know he is creating awareness at uh, this places uh, at chaneti at shog and topra so now we have to help this uh, all these people all the people like him who are working at all these sites uh, towards protection and preservation of this site come to that slide please that chaneti stupa site please so you can find that story about this uh, you can see the uh, the story about this stupa and uh, the local people how local people are working towards revitalization of this place uh, the local uh, panchayat head uh, the local village head he was a very good guy and uh, he he's like you know he told me how he is uh, organizing special prayers on the day of vaishak punnima although all the people living around are hindus but they appreciate that uh, this place uh, is associated with buddha and they are very sure that buddha because it is in kuru and uh, this stupa is very ancient it is from second century ad from kushana time so we have to make all these sites a living heritage and only way we can do it is by visiting these places and offering prayers next slide please next slide yeah so you can see this is river yamuna and uh, according to previous 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 yeah so you can see this is the river yamuna and this is ancient shug this whole village is settled on ancient city of shugna and you, when you visit this place it is all, all mound and you see this green patch so this green patch is the uh, remains of ancient monastery and an ashokan stupa which shwenzang says is the place where buddha gave talks so in ancient kuru this is the place according to shwenzang close to uh, yamuna river on the bank of yamuna where buddha gave his talk and this place it's a very such an interesting story when we went to this place there is a very good uh, a very prominent family they have a their house on the top of this mound and uh, so uh, when we visited we took permission from that lady and when we over uh, visited this lady when we told her that you, your house is settled on the mound so she said yes i am aware of the fact that i mean my house is uh, over a monastery and in monastery according to shenzang i mean uh, she was aware of the fact because uh, she was well read person so i told her that if in future somebody some buddhist people if they want to come and make offer uh, if they want to offer prayer at this place would you welcome them she said everybody is welcome i mean any buddhist person who wants to come and offer prayers if, if they want to stay overnight and meditate they are welcome to my place and so the idea is shenzang says shenzang i i believe in shenzang every time shenzang says it is seldom like you know one in 100 times when shenzang is like you know wrong that too we are not very sure that he is wrong so when if shenzang says that this is the this should be the place 
and there is a monastery uh, i mean there is a mound and this mound has got uh, lots of artifacts buddhist remains so there is no point of doubting what shrenzang says and uh, instead of waiting for its excavation and what we find inside we should start visiting this place and offer prayers and making this site as a living heritage site one of the ideas of this walk is because i mean <clears throat> people they say Uh, how do we know that uh, this is the exact place uh, let's wait for excavation but excavation is not possible every time and at all the places because there is there are villages settled over all these places and it's difficult to remove all this place uh, and rehabilitate uh, rehabilitate all these people and excavate all these sites so point is the sanctity is of the place and we know that this is the place based on shenzang so now we should, our effort should be to make this place living heritage so you can see uh, the detailed story of this site my visit to this place at uh, this blog link which is given here you can you can so you will find the story on my retracing bodhisattva shrenzan facebook page i have shared all those stories on the facebook page and we are also have also made a short documentary on this which is in i mean my friend uh, swendra talwar who was with me at this site i mean he's like you know uh we had collected some funds so that uh, we could make documentary film but uh, we only could get little funds so we have completed two sites shugna and sankisa so shugna we have already uh, done the shooting and uh, the the film is like you know on the editing table so maybe in month or two we will have the documentary film on this ready but in the meantime you can see the story on my blog yeah next slide please <clears throat> yeah so this is the mound of sankisa sankisa is a very important site this is the place where buddha after giving after after preaching his uh, mother uh, mahamaya who were uh, at uh, tusita heaven he descended here at uh, sankasya so out of eight great places this is the only place which has no excavated remains this site has not been excavated because this sankisa mound there is a village settled on the mound there is a village which is like you know on the mound on the top of the mound you can see uh, this mound this is huge mound and shrenzang so and fashian also before shrenzang fashian also nothing much changed the version of pashyan and shrenzang about sankasya is almost similar both of them they saw a walled campus in the campus they saw a temple of ladders where image of buddha is there flanked by indra and uh, uh, chakra and uh, and then he saw many other stupas to mark the events that followed like you know after descending from the heaven buddha took bath so there was a stupa to mark that event and uh, then there was an ashokan pillar which shrenzan says uh, it was close to the temple and then he talks about uh, other stupas like the stupa where buddha took samadhi and then there was a jeweled walk where buddha used to walk that place had a like you know raised platform with all those like you know we see at bodh gaya that uh, uh, footsteps of the buddha were marked by like you know lotus flowers so shrenzan saw a very big campus so this whole campus is buried inside this this village and uh, for some reason uh, i mean because somehow i mean this has been not been excavated so at when we visited this site i met some local people there is a local organization called uh, young buddhist organization uh, i stayed there during my lockdown for two months and i had a very detailed discussion with uh, these people who are very enthusiastic and very passionate about this uh, revitalization of sankasa so these guys they have a plan how to revitalize this place in stages slowly so i have prepared a story of this uh, uh, about what these people like so the, the 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 guy who is uh, uh, taking care of a uh, young buddhist uh, society uh, shreyas bodh and uh, venerable uh, upananda so these two people i met them and based on them and my own survey and meeting other stakeholders i prepared a story and we have also done some shooting also we have shot this place properly and we would be coming out with a documentary uh, film on this so the idea about this place is that uh, of the eight great places 
it's all the rest of the places like sarnath bodh gaya uh, shravasti um, vaishali lumbini kushinagar all these places have uh, the monastic remains and stupa excavated and people can see the remains but this is the only site which is like you know still uh, lying neglected the way it was discovered in 1844 by sir alexander cunningham it was among the first few sites which were discovered because all other sites had assumed new names but this was the place which continued with the same name this place when discovered it still had the same name sun kissa so it was not difficult for sir cunningham to discover to identify this place so it was among the first places besides bodh gaya and sarnath which was discovered and it took 20 years to discover shravasti because the map were not complete maps maps were not very accurate and places had new names so the idea is now the buddhist world should uh, think something of uh, how i mean swenang description should be the basis of uh, its excavation and now uh, this retracing bodhisattva swenang project also an idea it's also as a platform for all the like minded people this is what i discussed with victor v when we met last time that all of us should come together and uh, there should be a global movement towards revitalization of all these places this this is why these places are neglected they are all there are only counted places of buddha and uh, this puts of the buddha are so important those so sacred in this uh, places where uh, so much venerated for more than 1500 years and they are lying neglected for 700 years now so now since the world is aware about all these places their significance all the, everything is known so now we should think about how we can revitalize all these places in coming 10 20 30 years we should have a long term plan yes uh, next slide please So from Shravasti, I came to from Sankasya. I came to Shravasti. It was like 300 kilometer walk. So I took 10 days. So in between Shravasti and Sankasya, this is the place of Kashyapa Buddha. So there were four Buddhas of uh, Bhadra Loka of this aeon. This is Kanak Muni Buddha, Karak Chinda Buddha, Gautama Buddha, and Kashyapa Buddha. So the places of Karak Chinda Buddha and Kanak Muni Buddha are in Nepal. but the place of kashyapa buddha where he got enlightenment and where his body relics are enshrined according to zan that place was 60 li uh, northwest of shravasti so kaningam identified this place tandva mahant as the place of kashyapa buddha and when i visited this place i was like you know as shrenzang and fashian they fashian also visited this place and why this place is so important because i mean like you know fashian visited only few places he didn't he did not visit the, the very elaborate buddhist pilgrimage which shrenzang took fashian visited the most prominent places and like you know the places which everybody would go so fashian visited this place and shrenzang and fashian both of them they talk about a very huge stupa and this stupa this there is a hindu temple now uh, very popular hindu temple Uh, settled on this mound this mound is very huge it is, it is spread in like 4 acres and uh, because of lockdown it was totally like you know abandoned like mm, there was nobody but uh, that when i met the priest so they told me that during uh, normal days it's very crowded and lots of buddhist people also they come to this place uh because many people in shravasti many monks living in shravasti they are aware about this place so they say that i mean like in the, in the season uh, 400 500 visitors they visit this place but the idea is like you know my idea is this place is only 14 kilometers from shravasti and this could be a very good walking pilgrimage this walk i, I though i walked from sankasya to shravasti but the most interesting part was walking from this place to uh, shravasti it is like you know two and half hour walk 14 kilometers and such a beautiful landscape it's uh, mango garden on both side of the road so the idea is uh, we should develop this uh, kashapa buddha's place to shravasti jetvana as a walking pilgrimage uh, trail so people who are visiting shravasti and who have time uh, who are staying there for uh, one or two nights 
they can take out time in morning and evening they can do this walk this is a very beautiful place and worth visiting and uh, we have to make this place as a living heritage place next slide please next slide yeah so now coming to uh, this uh, why shwenzang i mean why i am such a big uh, uh, appreciator of shwenzang i am like you know overwhelmed by this guy his book his travel log the kind of detail he has shared and you can see he took so much of pain he started from i mean shian all way traveling like you know taking the silk route and coming documenting every single detail about the places and right from like you know uh, temris from this place this remains start now these are the these are the places from here shenzang starts seeing the buddhist things stupas monasteries and whole this landscape from temris kundus to up to like you know then indian subcontinent he took so much of pain he it, it took him like 5 years to start from changan and come to nalanda the place where he wanted to uh, be so and this guy took so much of pain uh, so much of effort for us as uh, dr v was telling uh, be, without shenzang you don't have anything i mean you will just be aware of this fact that buddha was in india buddha has got indian origin he was born somewhere in uh, lumbini nobody knows where lumbini is it's all shenzang description though we have inscription on lumbini saying that this is the birthplace of buddha but Shenzang talks about that pillar. That I mean, if you go to the birthplace of the Buddha, you will find a, a pillar with inscription. So <clears throat> this man's uh, contribution is extraordinary. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, though he came to Nalanda, after coming to Nalanda, he was like you know, his purpose was served. he met uh, shil bhadra this is nalanda here is nalanda so at nalanda his purpose was served he was properly taken care of he got all the text he wanted but still he was such a curious guy his curious was his curiosity was insatiable i mean this guy he wa he wanted to know everything he wanted to visit every shrine where buddha's relics were there so somebody told him you can venture a little west and you can try monasteries there also in spite of i mean like you know all his doubts were cleared at uh, nalanda he still went to this part and while he was here <clears throat> somewhere here in uh, uh, at uh, bengal present day bengal somebody told him that uh, in sri lanka there is a buddha relic and you will find some good uh, uh, sastra masters there who will uh, who, who can tell you uh, in depth about uh, other buddhist text so this guy you can just see you know from here just to see this relics of uh, buddha and to meet some other prominent teachers because he wanted to take back to china the best text available and since he was already in india so he wanted to visit every single place he was being told so he traveled from here and and but then he also told that if you go by sea route though it will be very short you can reach there quickly but chances of reaching there safely is very i mean less most of the time they ship they there's lots of like you know uh disturbance in the sea and uh, you may not survive so this poor guy he took land route and it took him months and months and months to reach this place and you know still at all these places which shenzang visited all his uh, description he he visited many monasteries here still archaeologists here based on shenzang description are find places his descriptions are so detailed and like you know <clears throat> detailed and uh, accurate so when he reached kanchipuram he was he got a shock of his life like you know he he was told that he cannot go to sri lanka because sri lanka was suffering from famine there was civil war, war going on and uh, all the monks from sri lanka they were coming to india so this guy he didn't lose hope so he stayed there in a monastery and he started meeting all the people who were coming from sri lanka and based on the discussion from those people he created the geography of buddhist sites of sri lanka and he would uh, be surprised though he didn't visit the sri lanka but his description are the basis of rediscovery of many sites in sri lanka because in sri lanka also for centuries buddhism was lost many sites were like abandoned 
so shrilanka even in shrilanka uh, shrenzang's accounts are so valuable so important and from here shrenzang visited all these sites and uh, this this is this, this is a place called anandpur uh, which is like you know our uh, present day prime minister narendra modi ji so his village is here so shrenzang i mean our prime minister wherever he goes i mean he says that i mean my visit, i i come from a place where shrenzang visited this, my my village so oh, shrenzang descriptions are like you know so from here then shrenzang so basically the idea is shrenzang visited so many places just because somebody told him on the way that you can you should visit this place which is like you know 10 days away from here you will find some good teachers there so he took so much of pain so much of trouble so this guy is his his uh, his contributions should be celebrated and properly like you know acknowledged next slide please <clears throat> i just wanted to give an example of uh, how important shrenzang's accounts are so you can see this is ashokan pillar uh, at vaishali kolhua so this is the picture when this site was discovered in 1860s and 70s so when this site was discovered this ashokan pillar was totally buried and you can see there were huts around it so there was a local ascetic who had made his uh, uh like you know his uh, abode there he was living there and nobody had any clue what is the significance of this place it is only when uh, uh, it's only because no inscription was found it's only shrenzang's account which says that this ashokan pillar and this stupa that we see and close to this place there is in a people who have visited this site they know there is a tank here so according to shrenzang this ashokan pillar and stupa ashokan stupa and this tank are the place to mark the market harda the place where monkey offered honey to buddha so this is the importance of shrenzang's account because no inscription has been found talking about the important significance of this place no inscription has been found so only thing which explains us the significance of this place is shrenzang's account so this is the importance of shrenzang he not only talks about like if you go to sarnath so only shrenzang says exact place where buddha gave the first sermon if you go to uh, bodh gaya so it's only shrenzang he says where are the seven week where uh, weeks where uh, buddha spent seven weeks which where are the those spots so similarly at all the places if you go to shravasti uh, where buddha uh, where was the mool gandkuti where is purva uh, rama so all these details about the site it's not just the location of the place it's also the details of the shrines in the site shrines at lumbini shrines at uh, kapilavastu sites at uh, shrines in the bodhgaya temple so all the details of the shrines inside that the site jetvana um, and all these places it comes from shrenzang's description so this guy shrenzang's contribution is extraordinary uh, and without him we could have never known the uh, the the footsteps of the buddha <clears throat> though we know the only fraction of uh, buddha wandering buddha made wandering for 45 years and he must have visited many places but whatever little we know it is only shrenzang so this walk is a tribute to this guy right, please so the objective of uh, this uh, our uh, walk is uh, to because the present day pilgrimage is limited to eight great places shravasti uh, bodh gaya lumbini sarnath kushinagar rajgir uh, vaishali sankasya shravasti but with this walk we want to spread awareness about the larger buddhist pilgrimage the sublime wandering of the buddha the small small the lesser known places where buddha stayed for two or three days and gave some talks uh, so the idea is to take the buddhist pilgrimage beyond eight great places to 22 places mentioned by shrenzang second objective of uh, this walk is to revive the tradition of walking pilgrimage so the idea is also to identify and establish the walking pilgrimage trails if supposedly is there somebody some people who want to walk to these places so we should in coming four to five years we should have proper uh places like you know after every day walk where can somebody stay safe stay 
where somebody can safely stay. And uh, the idea is also that this uh, trail should be connecting the ancient Buddhist sites because the whole of this Gangetic plain are full of ancient Buddhist remains, Buddhist sites. So the idea is also that this walking pilgrimage trail should be touching the ancient Buddhist sites if there are some, some in between. And the most important objective of this project is to celebrate and commemorate the contributions of world city in Xuanzang. So the idea is all these places where it, which are discovered and we know about uh, the significance of these places based on Xuanzang, we should have a park, we should have some plaque, we should have some statues of Xuanzang so that Xuanzang becomes a household name. People should not just see him as a traveler. He was not an ordinary traveler. He just didn't come and uh, made a, or he, his wanderings are so important. So uh, the idea is uh, that uh, uh, we should have, uh, uh, we should celebrate uh, uh, his, con uh, his contribution. We should have proper memorials, parks, uh, and com uh, plaques uh, talking about uh, the detailed contribution of Shenzhen. He's not an ordinary guy, he's a bodhisattva. Uh, so uh, these are the objectives of the project. And uh, I hope, uh, rather, I should say, we hope, uh, because this is a big team. And now with uh, Dr. V's participation and uh, whole world can participate, all the people who are like, you know, uh, who want this uh, footsteps of the Buddha to get revitalized, to get living, it becomes a living heritage. So all of us have to join our hands and maybe we can have a long term project, 10, 20 years project, so that slowly, gradually. Uh, connecting the local people and uh, trust me wherever I went all the local people they are very enthusiastic they are so, they are so happy every time I tell them that Buddha was here Shenzhang was here they become very curious I mean sometimes I have to stay awake till 11 11 30 in the night though I have to resume walk because it is summer so I start very early three o'clock in the morning because after 7 30 it becomes very hot very warm so I start I start my walk at three o'clock so till 10 30 and 11 people they surround me and they want to know more about Buddha, they want to know more about Shenzhang. So people are curious, they want to know. And they are so proud about this fact that Buddha was here. Buddha was at the, the, those places. Shenzhang was at all those places. So the idea is to connect the local people and international uh, audience, uh, the uh, people all over the world and make this entire uh, wandering of the Buddha as a living heritage and let whole of the world, let's celebrate it. So if there are any questions, uh, we can have questions. Yes. Okay, so uh, so we had a very uh, very interesting uh, and fascinating presentation by Deepak, and uh, you know, um, so uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, you could see that actually, uh, you could see the enormous contribution that Sanchang has made to Buddhist pilgrimage. Uh, actually, when I listened to the talk that uh, uh, Deepak that you have given, I was wondering, wow, what a wonderful person this is, uh, Sanchang. He was so detailed that he was able to, but just by using his account, you can almost like identify the actual place which occurred. And it's not just a site, but all the details that he, he has given. And how fortunate we are that we have somebody like him to leave and record. This record was done in the seventh century. Yeah, it's quite fantastic. Uh, maybe I could begin by asking uh, Deepak a question, right? Uh, when was it that you discover about Swentang? I, I must also say that one of the discoveries that I have is that among the Indians, the Indians generally know more about Suanzang than the Chinese. The Chinese idea of Suanzang was really from the, the monkey god story, and Suanzang was the monk, okay, yeah. was very idealistic, that god went on a white horse, and sometimes he was, he's also too honest, too good, that sometimes the monkey is there to protect him. So that was almost a caricature of what Sun Chang is. But actually, if you know Sun Chang, he was filled with so much creativity and he had to meet up with kings. And every time when he appears before kings, the kings were all convinced, you know, 
they were very, really impressed with his learning and his personality. So that was not the Sun Zhang, the real Sun Zhang that the Chinese knew. But amongst the Indians, when they learned about Sun Zhang, they actually learned the story of Sun Zhang. It is only very recently that stories. Dr. V, I want to tell you, I want to add yeah. one thing. You know why, yeah. why in this 16th century, this, this monkey king came up? Because, you know, this story of Shenzhang is not a human thing, you know, because in China, people could not believe that somebody could cross uh, Gobi Desert alone and like, you know, cross Xi'an Mountain and took this route alone. I mean, defying the king's order. So this character was created that this extraordinary journey could be done because of so that people start believing that this journey happened. So this all these caricatures were created to just to make this possible. So uh -huh. you can just imagine how such an extraordinary work, I mean, this, uh, this uh, journey of Shenzhen is so extraordinary that it is very difficult to digest that somebody could, some human can do it. That is why he's a bodhisattva. This, this journey could not, uh, was, was not possible for an ordinary human being. Yeah, please continue. That's right. So when he went on this journey, he actually had to sneak out of the kingdom because yeah. it was uh, forbidden for him to travel. And uh, there was the reign of Taichung, which is the, the emperor of Tang. And when he came back finally, he had to write a letter to uh, plead, uh, to ask permission from the emperor for him to re-enter China. And at that time, the emperor Taichung is now consolidated his power and you know, very, very powerful king. And he was also surprised, how could anybody, you know, in the right <laughs> mind, have the determination of crossing the Silk Road Wow, you cannot imagine what the Silk Road is. Because I actually did lead tours on the Silk Road. You know that the barren, some places you go, it's just rocks and just barren and only shrubs. How would anybody survive in that environment? And of course, you go to the sandy and you go up to the snowy mountains and it is impossible. So the story of the Monkey King was written about 1,000 years after Sun Chang's actual journey, right? So actually, um, but yeah. Sun Chang is the thinking factor within, the China, between China and India. You know, because he went to India, yeah, yeah, he had yeah. very cool things to say about Nalanda and all that. You know, he praised yeah, a lot yeah. of discovered and such glowing terms. So he was almost like yeah. a oh, the person that links China and India. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, and you know, I mean, he was so humble. He was, uh, yeah. yeah. My yeah. question is yeah, that what, was... is it, what is it that inspires you about Sun Zhang? When did you start getting interested in Sun Zhang? And uh, since you begin on this project, what are the kind of support that you have received to, to, to do this? Wow, when I heard about this project, I said, wow, this is incredible, you know, because people have not done this before, following the trail of Sun Zhang. So I had this idea of doing this trail uh, long back, but I didn't have this confidence because when I read this book of uh, Shun Shuan, the 10,000 miles without a cloud, so that book, I mean, although I had, by that time, I, I had already read the Shuanzang's uh, travelogues, Thomas Waters' version. But when I read this uh, Shun Shuan's book, 10,000 Miles Without a Cloud, it was very inspiring still. And uh, so uh, this book was so extraordinary. And uh, so I, this was, uh, I read this book in 2007. And uh, immediately after 2007 or eight, I read this book. And uh, at that time, I had this, this in my mind that someday I would, uh, I would like to do a part of Shenzhang Trail. But I never had this, like, you know, what to say, this, uh, like, because, I mean, there's so many difficulties in uh, doing any such kind of thing. But recently, in 2018 uh, December, uh, 19 December, I had opportunity to walk with Paul Shalopek. He is doing this out of Eden walk. So I had an opportunity because he, he, he came from a walking from Africa, he's walking this trail of like, you know, uh, where, uh, I mean, from Africa, he's uh, walking through all the countries. So he came to Bodh Gaya and we had a chance meeting and he said he wants to walk a Buddha trail to, uh, as a part of his whole project. So then I had an opportunity to walk with him for 100 kilometers from Bodh Gaya to Nalanda. So during that time, I was, I felt that I can do this walk. <clears throat> I can walk like, you know, 30, 40 kilometers each day. And then Paul Shalopek uh, motivated me that you should try this. So from that day, I started planning about it. I shared this idea with my friend uh, Surendra Talwar, who is a very good filmmaker. I shared it with my friend Alok Jain, who is a very good photographer. And we didn't have any more resources, you know, and we thought that uh, this walk should be properly documented and uh, uh, a story should come out. So 
I spoke to my another friend, uh, Dr. Aprajita Goswami. So all four of us, uh, we didn't had any money, any funds, and we estimated that we would need something like you know, uh, ten to twenty thousand dollars at least, like you know, thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars for making documentary films and doing all these things. So we said, I mean, let's try something. You know, let's float a uh, what do you say, um, a platform for people to contribute. But then, when this walk was start to be, uh, about to start, there was a, this corona thing, this corona virus <laughs> came up, so uh, everything <laughs> fell apart. But still, we said no, project should continue. So we had some funds with us, so we did shooting at, we did some uh, filming at uh, uh, first three sites, and after that, when our uh, funds exhausted, so we thought that I mean, let's continue with the walk, let's finish the walk, filming can happen later on. If fund comes, otherwise also if fund doesn't comes, then we should continue with our stories only on the blog, and we can come with the book later on. But the idea is like you know, this is not uh, this project doesn't belongs to me or my team. I mean, it's it is a whole world's project. Swanzan belongs to whole world, and this Buddha's footsteps is everybody's thing. And uh, now the all of us should come together. Yeah. So uh, and. Uh, the Cunningham and his generation has done a great job. So now we are in a better position to do something, something similar or better than that. So we should try. We should make an effort at least. If we don't succeed, no problem. But people should not say that we didn't make effort. We should try something. Yes, actually, Deepak, yeah. uh, when you mentioned about the book, 10,000 Miles Without a Cloud, written by uh, Sun Xu Yi. Actually, that was the actual book that also inspired me. That book actually came as a present from that in Sri Kiming, yeah. She gave it to me. <laughs> and when I started reading this book, I said, wow, this is really amazing. Uh, this book is, of course, written in English. She was actually born in China. And uh, then I think she went to the Oxford University and she met up with an Indian scholar who asked her, who, uh, whom do, does she think to the Indian as a, as a great Chinese personality? And she couldn't figure out who. She thought it's probably like Chairman Mao and all that. And that's Indian scholar in Oxford, you know. <laughs> it was actually uh, uh, Sun Zhang. And she says, what? What's Sun Zhang? Who is Sun Zhang? And she went to the library in Oxford University and started looking into the uh, background of Sun Zhang. And then she became interested on Sun Zhang. And she actually followed, uh, the, uh, along the sea road, she actually traveled the journey, a good part of the journey that Sun Zhang took. And I think she also visited yeah. India, although not as detailed. So it, she actually traced through the sea road and actually that was, uh, I was inspired that I also organized three different sea roads to, to, to follow some of these routes that, that she did, you know, to see the current day what happened and what was described by Sven Zhang. So really very inspiring. But what you are doing, Deepak, is you are actually doing an equivalent of what Sun Tzu Yin has done because she did it along the sea road and her uh, travel in India was, was not a lot. But what you did was you actually tried to follow the Sun Chang's route in India itself, which Sun Tzu Yin did not do. So I think this is fantastic. Uh, you should come up with a book, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that is, I mean, responsibility of my partners, uh, Dr. Aprajita Goswami and uh, Surendra Talwarji. So, I mean, my objective is, uh, my idea is to write stories on blog. So maybe, yes, we can come out with a book, which uh, the idea after this walk, I mean, we are also planning to do similar walks in Buddhist countries because people in Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand, all these countries, people should be aware about strength and contribution. All these people, they come in numbers at all these sites. But I doubt that all of them, they know the contribution of Shenzhen and the depth of contribution. I mean, not just, I mean, that, yes, these sites were discovered on the Shenzhen's basis, but the depth, the details. If you go to both the, then the details of the, uh, the history of tree, how tree came and what happened to tree and all the local shrines, what is the significance of the local shrines. So the depth of the, the details that Shenzhen has given. So people, all these Buddhist countries should know. So maybe I'm thinking after this walk is over, so after one or two years, I would be doing a similar walk in Buddhist countries, walking 100 or 200 kilometers in Japan, Korea, uh, and uh, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, Burma, 100, 200 kilometers just giving the books to the monasteries that come on. I mean, this is, uh, we know about this, all these places because of Master Shwenzan, he's Bodhisattva. 
so after after buddha if you are if you are follower of the buddha so you should also talk about shenzang you should have image of shenzang in your monastery this is the guy who has given landscape the geography of the buddha so that is the next stage of uh, this walk mm, okay <laughs> it's very interesting yeah and actually yeah. when the chenchen came back to china and uh, the yoga chara school was there and so because yoga chara school is more like meditation analysis of abhidhamma of the mind and all that yeah. uh, but later on the yoga chara school in china disappeared uh, but at the same time the yoga chara school went to japan so in japan yeah. there's yeah. scholars looking at yoga chara and that's why the japanese when you talk about the sirot they get really excited <laughs> yeah and, yeah the japanese so i think there's a lot of potential and also for the malaysians since the malaysians uh, you know uh, many of you have not really heard uh, the real story of like suanjang especially the places that he has uncovered this angle you have not known you probably know about yeah. now there are movies and you've seen how he traveled to the sirot and all that but this aspect yeah yeah who this you know <laughs> so it is time for us to discover <laughs> yeah do you know do you know why this is happening because <clears throat> stranzang has got multiple legacy he has got this translation legacy he has got like in you know, his school thoughts then he has he is uh, he, he pilgrimage legacy is also there but chinese people or chinese government or chinese agency they are purposely just promoting his translation legacy they are just trying to promote him as a like you know translator who has brought buddhist text he is a tripitaka master so because they think that if they will talk about the pilgrimage legacy then focus will go out of china and come to the I mean, indian subcontinent for indian people sometimes i mean they say that oh shenzang is a chinese guy i mean so somehow this guy's his contribution is not being talked about because people are confused they don't want to talk about the, his contribution because chinese think the focus will go to india india thinks the focus will go to china so they talk about him very like you know tangentially but they don't realize one thing this guy is a world citizen he doesn't belongs to a country or tribe or city, uh, like you know a clan his his contribution is he is a, he belongs to the world so yes, that's right we <laughs> should talk his pilgrimage legacy is extraordinary there are many monks who have done translations but this is the only monk who has done the pilgrimage work i mean pilgrimage diary so his contribution pilgrimage legacy is second to i mean like as you told there are four chinese classics and it is one of them i i should say if there is some classics in the world so this shenzang's account should be like you know one of the classics of the world actually the part when you mention about about the, the how pre precise it was uh, because i lead uh, tours to the sir road for instance when we go to uh, uh, at the there is a cave called besaklik cave in tufan uh, tufan is the second lowest depression in the world and they were supposed they have murals paintings in the, on the walls and i think over time the paintings have all been destroyed but the russians discovered about about uh, this uh, besaklik and they actually have cut out these paintings and brought back to russia so in my last visit to st petersburg at the hermitage museum what i could not okay. see in the actual cave itself was actually found in st petersburg in the, in the best in the hermitage uh, museum so uh, the germans the russians the japanese the british everybody went on the yeah. accounts of so to see to discover whatever they could get and at that time of course china was in this array during the qing dynasty it was like falling apart so there was a time when the treasure hunters by using a council of sun tang went for many of these places in order to hunt treasures yeah. in the desert i think we've got a question there's very interesting very interesting stories that they would bribe the local priest who were poor yes. guys who were like you know do not know what the kind of treasure they have so with some little money and little food and little gifts they would open their uh, treasure chests and these guys they would <laughs> load their i mean like you know horses and camels full of this manuscript and take away so i mean this <laughs> shun shuan in his and her book has mentioned about those stories <laughs> yes uh um deepak there is a question for from the brother uh, damendra kumar he says can't we Can you... take as uh, asi to help in the excavation of sinkasha mount asi is of course the yeah, uh... I mean, ultimately yeah yeah asi would but but i mean we need to convince asi 
there should be an international pressure on archaeological survey of india to like you know take up this work uh, in a very like you know and this place would need lots of funds because they have to displace their people settled on the mount so lots of funds so somehow we have to collect fund if government of india gives it's fine otherwise we have to collect internationally from the people so there should be a group who should initiate this discussion with government of india so yeah. because this is sankisa is basically the stakeholders are everywhere so people buddhist people all over the world they should join hands and they should they should initiate discussion with government of india archaeological survey of india yeah so so what we should do is to try to interest the government of india to see that this potentially can bring more pilgrimage because sankashia is one of the eight places uh, there are there are four places uh, uh, associated with the buddhist life right and that four other places of miracles yeah. and sankashia is one of the places of miracles yeah. this is the only one that is not uh, excavated and the uh, archaeological society of india is very competent they've got good people there but because there's so many places yeah. for them to do excavations unless as a buddhist community we say this is really important for us this is a form yeah. of, of miracles and please do something yeah. to excavate you know yeah make it, a priority. make it a priority uh, we make it a priority yeah. there is another question from um, brother lim k bang yes or oh, was the hard prashna paramita sutra collected from nalanda by shanjang prashna paramita yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it is It is. It is. <laughs> yeah, Shenzhen. Yeah. Shenzhen collected text from many places. He visited many monasteries. So he collected, as uh, Doctor V uh, was talking, he collected six hundred and fifty-seven uh, proper sutra scrolls. So yeah. he he might have collected hard sutra from many places. I mean, not just Nalanda. I mean, yeah. uh, he visited many other monasteries in Magadh also, like Tila Tiloshika Monastery. and many other monasteries he visited so he collected uh, sutras from many places so yeah. we cannot he exactly say i mean or, yeah nalanda uh, but the prashna paramita sutra is a major sanskrit sutra and uh, which twenchang brought back uh, to to china and he spent uh, time just translating the sutra this sutra is very very huge and uh, you know at that time he was trying to get the support from emperor taizong and emperor taizong thinks that he was more linked up with the taoist tradition so he he all the way yeah. admired sanzang but he's keeping sanzang at the arms length but when he came to a yeah. chapter of the pashana paramita which talks about the qualities of a great king sanzang so translated yeah. that and presented that to the emperor taizong and when the emperor saw that he said wow this one describes me as an emperor and from that yeah. time always the emperor got close <laughs> to sanzang yeah. and this sanzang translated Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, even there's a like story. Uh, the, uh, when Shen Zhang came back to China after his journey, so people would ask him, "How could you do this arduous journey? How could you do this?" So he said, "Every time I had difficulty, I would recite Heart Sutra." So I mean, uh, after the, 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 this hard, reciting of Heart Sutra, would would ward off all the problems. so people in china they started believing that heart sutra has got some like you know potential it has got some potential to ward off problems so just like in india we have one chalisa every time you are danger in some problem people recite heart this uh, hanuman chalisa so in china people like you know involuntarily like you know when they get in problem they start uh, chanting heart sutra because chenzang said that heart sutra was miraculous you know every time he was in danger heart sutra saved him so this was the effect of uh, and shenzang even when this uh, uh, heart sutra when it is kept in boxes so they have a layer of protecting deities a scroll of protecting deities on the cover of this uh, uh, manuscript so shenzang is one of the protecting deities of uh, heart sutra so it's such a like you know yeah, shenzang is considered so much uh, important for heart sutra yes <laughs> there is there is one question from uh, Dr Tim Ong yes Dr Tim Ong says Deepak what is the biggest obstacle that you have encountered in your journey so far no obstacle sir till now total fun i mean like you know uh, every step i'm walking i'm thinking of i'm reminded of the buddha and shenzang so there's no problem i mean shenzang if you read shenzang text travel accounts you will find that shenzang has never talked about any difficulties he has never spoken about like you know he even when he talks about uh, 
uh, he, he the even if he has faced some problems he has mentioned like you know very broadly in his biography otherwise if if you go through his uh, travel accounts he has not at all talked about where he stayed where he took food and other difficulties mundane things so similarly i am walking the shenzhan trail so i am maintaining the spirit of shenzhan so i am not thinking about those things what come may i am not worried about where i'm going to stay where i'm going to have food i'm just thoroughly enjoying mindfully mindfully walking this trail and uh, trying to like you know meet the objectives of the project of like you know educating creating awareness about the shenzhan and uh, buddha among the places which i am visiting where i am staying so no difficulties nothing no difficulties from my nothing <laughs> So that's wonderful. So you didn't meet up with that problem that Sun Chang met when he was doing his journey. So you're you're really Sun blessed. Sun Chang Sun Chang doesn't talks about any problems. I mean, he never talks about. I mean, where he took food and difficulty in getting. I mean, it's uh, uh, he's just focusing on uh, places and Buddha and the text he's collecting. Maybe so. This thing. <laughs> I mean, this is a part of the journey. If you're doing something like this, so you will. You will. Uh, this is obvious. that the food and stay place you won't find star or you won't find five star hotels and like you know proper beds sometimes you have to sleep on uh, under the tree in the temple corridors uh, i mean under open sky so in last uh, uh, 40 50 days which i have walked i have slept anywhere i got in a uh, place to sleep i mean i am not demanding like you know whatever people offer because this is also time of corona so i cannot ask for people i cannot say people that i mean get, give me a room so whatever i get for people are kind i mean like you know whatever they offer i just accept it whatever food they are offering whatever place they are offering i i i just accept it okay yeah there's there's some question here from uh, marie tunka she says how do we know the place of mahakashapa is in uh, is one of your sites sir it is a, it is is a long time ago uh before the forming of this uh, actually that's not correct marie uh in this world system in this uh, aeon four buddhas have arisen and the buddha is kakusanda uh, buddha uh konagamana kashapa and gotama four the fifth one is going to be maitreya so uh kashapa buddha is actually within this world system but the question is that question is that since it's a long time ago how do we know that that's the birth place or the place of enlightenment of kashapa buddha i think uh, you touch on it deepak can you like do you like to ex- explain and uh, yeah deepak needs to uh, stretch his leg a little bit yeah please sorry okay. yeah okay. anything from okay. yeah sorry that yeah. the question they were like yeah the, the question from so, mary uh, how how do we know the place of mahakashapa is 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 talking is, about mahakashapa or kashapa buddha mahakashapa is different than kashapa buddha is that's different true. that's true it's the kashapa buddha kashapa buddha because kashapa. Ju- uh, you have yeah. earlier show the kashapa buddha no mahakashapa is different yeah mahakashapa is different so mahakashapa place is in magadha that is gurpa gurupada so it is very close to both gaya so uh, i will do that place when i come to go to magad so the, the site which i visited was the site of kashapa buddha mm. as a kashapa buddha and as you say that yeah. he was identified by cunningham was it cunningham based on fossian and shenzhan travel accounts and this is i, I believe in that site because uh, it's a very huge stupa very huge yeah 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 for you to have a huge stupa it means the place must be really significant really important that's what the stupa is significant i mean yeah Shenzhen. I mean, I, I, I'm going to put that story soon. I mean, it will take another 15, 20 days. So Cunningham, when he did excavation, he found that stupa in a proper shape. You know, he found those four cardinal, uh, like you know, that the steps. So, uh, and at the time of uh, Cunningham, that was not that village was not very highly populated. So stupa was in proper shape. So during my visit, I saw that that is like you know totally now taken over by the concrete thing. so there are temples built over there shopping complex sort of thing and like you know different thing, other things so it is but still i mean you can see that it is a very big mound it's spread in four acres it's a big big mound okay and there's a question sankashia uh due to traveling route logistics based on your 
on-site experience? Can you propose the pilgrimage route uh, that covers all the eight sites? I think some pilgrimages will bring people to Shankashia, but because Shankashia is not developed, yeah. Yeah. So this is why it's often bypassed in the, the pilgrimage. Yeah. Uh, yes. But roads you, are now very good. How much? Yes. So you can go to are now very good. On your way to Agra, right? Yeah, After Sankasya, yeah. Agra and then to you Delhi. You can go to Agra. But Sankasya yeah. of, often overlooked. Because when you go there, like what Deepak says that, you know, you don't really have very much unless it's excavated. Yeah, I you have four plus four. Yeah. Mm. So I mean, that is why I'm saying, yeah, Zareen Kahisi is my friend. Yeah, she wants to know about a uh, recommendation to read on Shenzhan. That book, 10,000 miles without the flag. It's the same yeah. book. Can you flash it, Alex? <laughs> it's the same book. You can get this book online. That is, yeah, that is appetizer. To begin uh, with, 10,000 miles <laughs> 10, without a cloud is an appetizer. Yeah, yeah. This is a book. This is a book. It's very inspiring. This is a fantastic book. <laughs> she grew up in China during the Cultural Revolution. So the father was a red god. The grandmother was praying to Kuan Yin, <laughs> although he was forbidden. And she grew up, didn't know much about Xuanzang until she met up with this Indian scholar in Oxford. And she did a research and started going on the trail of Xuanzang. And then, so she was comparing what she sees right now, what was mentioned in Xuanzang, you know, so, so you, you get a lot of information. It is really, it is a very well written book, very inspiring. I think when you read this, you'll get the travel bug of wanting to travel along the sea road and maybe go to India as well. Uh, yeah, her this name book is will make you curious. Once you finish, once you read this book, you get curious yeah. to know more and then another and like you know that's why i said this book is the appetizer so after this i mean then you like you know you get really hungry to know more and more and more and then you go for samuel beale and thomas waters everything you can find on uh, on the net yes yes and uh in sun Xuyun's book also do you have some bibliography you can follow up on some of the readings that that is recommended to her and this book is available online so you can buy you can download it online as well but yeah, uh, there's a question by Jin, uh, brother Jin Lim. Uh, okay, wow, <laughs> you're asking me. Yeah. Do do I intend yeah. to lead a walk pilgrimage anytime in the near future? Actually, we have something in the offering, but with the COVID nineteen, it becomes a bit difficult to have something on this year. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we actually discuss yeah. discuss this. In, uh, this year is a bit tough because. Um, uh, traveling is tough, difficult, yes, and um, so uh, I mean it is something that 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 we like to do, yeah, in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe in Magad we can do small, small trails. I mean, not necessarily the whole walking pilgrimage, but in Magad there are some trails of the Buddha which we can do, like you know, in a daytime, uh, fourteen kilometers, fifteen kilometer trails. Definitely, we can have a like you know taste of uh, walking pilgrimage. Mm. I was supposed to lead some pilgrimage in India this year. But because of the COVID-19, because uncertainty of the airlines and all that, well, this year is difficult to, to organize things. Uh, maybe next year, if things, things improve, we might actually be able to do some things, okay? And there's a question that comes in, yes. Uh, oh, uh, places that the Buddha once wandered and taught. Uh, what can the Buddhist community do to preserve the sacred places? Yeah? Just visit the places. If you start visiting, because the sanctity is of the place. So uh, if we start visiting these places, so slowly, slowly, gradually, next 20, 30 years, things will, I mean, start coming up, start coming up. So the first step is to visit these places. We, let's not question Shenzhen. Most of the time people say, I mean, should we believe in this? This may be not be there because, I mean, Shenzhen, because you have to believe Shenzhen. Sites have been discovered on the basis of Shenzhen. So why we are doubting few places, other places? So first step should be to go to these places and start veneration. So slowly, slowly temples will come up and maybe next 20, 30 years, they will become living heritage. It's a process. It took 1500 years for these places to come up. To make heritage. Let's know. 
Yes, I think I think that is that is correct because I think the Indian government is also looking for signals from the Buddhist community. You know, the Indian government is yeah. now very uh, very keen to uh, to promote Buddhist uh, places of pilgrimage. In fact, I have been invited uh, a couple of times to India, to, even to speak in conferences, um, where the, where the Indian government has called uh, travel agents that specializes on Buddhist Buddhist pilgrimage, and uh, Indian government is very keen to promote. And they want more places uh, for people to know. I, I think last year or two years ago, uh, Indian government has, uh, under the auspices of in the International Buddhist Confederation, we went to the Ajanta Caves and all that. So they want to introduce more places to the Buddhists. So if you go to, if the Buddhists were to go to any place, the Indian government knows, oh, this is a place that the Buddhists are keen. Then they will actually begin to uh, beautify the place. That's the point, yeah. That's actually, over the years, I see the places, I started visiting the holy places since 1980. Uh, in the 1982, I think, 82, 83, first time that I did a uh, pilgrimage in India. And if you see the places then, compared to now, it is very, very different. Because I think the Indian government has put in quite a bit of resources to improve the places. So places of interest, if the Buddhists begin to show interest, then, then you begin to get the response from the Indian government, and it is possible. And that is how we help to develop places of, uh, of, of uh, Buddhist heritage. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. There's a, a question from Michelle KL. Is there any mention of how old, roughly, uh, oh, yeah. when Master Sun Chang was when he did the trip in India? Yes, of course. <laughs> I think. Yeah, Sun yeah. was like you know 27 year old when he started when he left China, and after 17 years he arrived back in China when he attained Nirvana. Parirvana in uh, at the age of uh, 62 in 664. So at the age when Fashian started from China to India, Shenzang already attained Nirvana. Fashian started very late. He started in, at the age of 61. Uh, he was an old monk and Shenzang started very young. He was only 27. He was a, like, you know, by the age of 20, he was like, you know, top monk of China of that time. Yes. Yeah. He, was, he, was, he was brilliant. And along the way, he also mastered the, the local languages. He spent about two years yeah. in the, uh, mastering Kashmir. Sanskrit before going over yeah, to Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir. Yes, he learned yeah, Sanskrit. Actually, no. Yeah, actually, uh, let me add something. Uh, uh, Shwenzang had such a high regards for Indian <laughs> <in> teachers. <coughs> sorry. He thought that... Uh, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Actually, what happened, you know, uh, Shenzhen thought that when he will go to India, he will find all the teachers will be very good in Sanskrit. Although he was himself very good in Sanskrit, but still he didn't want to take chance. So everywhere he got an opportunity to perfect his Sanskrit, he stayed there <laughs> and perfected his Sanskrit. So. Kashmir at that time was center of Sanskrit uh, learning. So he spent two years there. Okay. And of course, when Chang uh, spent, uh, uh, he, he spent his time in Xi'an, and as you know, the Xi'an is the terminus, uh, ter terminal point of the Silk Road. And many people from, the, from Central Asia, the merchants will actually open up, they will uh, sell things in the market in Xi'an. So Sun Chan could have actually moved around them and pick up the Turkic language, that Uyghurs and all that. So when he traveled along the way, he actually didn't have so much difficulty. And also because he was very friendly, he was six footer, handsome man, very intelligent and able to connect with people. So actually that really helped him in, in his journey. And actually there's one interesting story that I think I must share, share with the rest of you who are listening to it. And this is about Sila Badra. The, the, the Grand Master in Nalanda who specializes on the philosophy of Yogacara and all that. You know, Sula Bhadra was about in the 80s and he was very old, the body was giving him trouble. So he think that there's the time for him to leave this world, to expire. And then he had a dream. He had a dream, it's a big bright light appeared before him in his dream, Sula Bhadra. Sula Bhadra wanted to die, he wanted to pass away. And the dream says, no, no, no. Master Sula Bhadra, this is not the time for you to go. Because in three years' time, you're going to have a very special student that will come from the East, and he will bring the teachings over. He is the one who's going to spread the teachings. So you got to wait for him. So Silibhadra was able to kind of 
defer his passing away. And of course, Sun Chung took about three years to reach. When he arrived at Nalanda, obviously, you know, he had gone through so much trouble and he almost was killed so many times. So when you come to Nalanda, it was like, it's like if you can kiss the ground, you will like kiss the ground. <laughs> so when he lost out, Sayyidina Badra, wow, they filled with so much emotion. This was the monster that I was looking for. And Sila Badra saw this, this bright man coming from the doorway. And he says, this is the student that I was waiting for. Then they had a conversation. And when Sila Badra says, can you tell me how long did you take to come here? And Sun Chang says, it took me three years. And Sila Badra also cried, <laughs> you know? It's like, this is the student I'm waiting for. And here he is, he appears before me. Wow, <laughs> that's quite a remarkable story. <laughs> I think we have a question here. Uh, Dr. Tim Ong, wouldn't it be great if there is an app that allows people to follow and share your journey in real time? How about it, Deepak? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it's very difficult because, you know, it's very difficult to even record the coordinates because net is always like fluctuating and sometimes there's no electricity. So, uh, but I mean, what's the point? I mean, if uh, real time basis following the trail is uh, like, you know, something uh, not very easy to do and uh, not, I mean, like, you know, not worth it also. I don't see any good reason for like, you know, doing this. Uh, yes. I'm sharing all the stories after later on, whatever I'm seeing was observing. So I'm making pictures and writing stories on my travel. I'm, I'm sharing the, I would be putting all the coordinates on the map. Uh, and I would be sharing the map of the places where I stayed uh, every single day, how many kilometers I walked. So, I mean, uh, uh, this idea of this app is, uh, it will be too busy. I, I, instead of collecting stories, then I will be busy in the app itself. Like, you know, yeah. my, my idea with this is to collect stories. So I will, I have to be more mindful about like, you know, it, it's still during this walk. I mean, it's sometimes very difficult because it's so warm to make pictures. Also, you are so tired. So taking out camera and making picture. So it's so tiring. And in that, if you have some app to, I mean, like, you know, always play around with, so this will make whole walk like very clumsy. And uh, so idea is to connect with people and connect and to create, uh, find good stories and document everything which I see. So app is, I don't think it's a good idea. It's like, you know, yes, but uh, actually what Deepak has done is that he has written blogs. You can follow him in the Facebook and his blogs and a very detailed account. I'm actually impressed when I read the blog. Well, you know, the, uh, the, um, the, either you or the writers give a very detailed account of, you know, of what happened in the village and all that interactions with the local people. Very, very interesting. So in fact, of instead of having an app, you can actually follow the blogs. And there are pictures yeah. and stories and the deep part will also come in, be coming up with documentaries. So maybe, uh, you know, because in the app, the walking journey itself takes so long in a day and uh, for, for him to be able to put content in the app, this will be really be too demanding for him. <laughs> It's, it's like, you know, I mean, also it's very difficult every time to charge even mobile phone because I mean, I'm mostly generally walking through the highways and rural areas and in the area, in that time of Corona, you cannot go to house and say that I want to charge my mobile to give me, allow me to put this thing. So it's like, you know, this, uh, this is a uh, walk is happening in a very difficult time. Actually, like, you know, uh, I, I still appreciate the local people who are not uh, discriminating. Like they are not saying me that keep away. They are welcoming still in spite of all this difficulty and difficult times, they are welcoming. They, they are not like, you know, what do you say? They're not asking me to keep away. They're not just like uh, pushing me. Otherwise, it's a very like, you know, Corona situation is not a very uh, nice situation to walk, to do such kind of project. But since uh, there I, is I started so yeah. Uh, there is a question, uh, Deepak. This is from uh, Arun Kumar. He says, what is oh, the most interesting uh, part of your journey? Most interesting part is that wherever I go, all these sites, the local people are so, I mean, the people who are living by these sites, when they get to know that uh, this is uh, Buddha and Shenzhen's place, so they are so fascinated. Uh, these people, they are very highly respected. Uh, there is this, uh, I have, during my this guiding, Career, I have met people who think that in India, 
local people are against buddhism there is some theories floating in uh, buddhist country that uh, the local people they led to demise of buddhism and uh, uh, they are against buddhism but that is not the fact if you go in present day india in the local places local people are so proud of the fact that buddha was from this place so and i am documenting all those things i mean they are, i i told you you know during late evenings after uh, we finished dinner so dinners are very long it takes i mean because these people they collect around me they want to know more about shenzang they want to know more about buddha when i tell that i mean buddha might have walked through this trail so they say oh come on this is so interesting so local people are very excited about being part of this uh, associated with this legacy of buddha and shenzang so there's a great potential in future Mm-hmm. Yes, which is which is quite interesting because sometimes people do have the idea that maybe the local people will not be supportive of Buddhism, but not so from your own experience. That is quite quite that is in really interesting because you go down onto the grassroots level, the villages, yeah. and you are touching touching the lives of people. You know, which is really quite interesting uh, because normally when people go on tours, you go on tour buses, you just touch and go take pictures here, take pictures there, and not yeah. much interact with local people. Here you're going down to the village. You stay with them. You eat with them, and you hear stories from them, and they hear stories from you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. There is a question here. It's from Ajay Krishna. Uh, do you yes, think yes, Venerable yes, Sarenjak yes. had also used the content of Farshan's travel log while narrating his travel experiences? To what extent does Venerable Sarenjak uses Farshan's travel log? uh there is a just a passing remark i mean there is no concrete evidence whether shenzang was even aware of fashian but there are some scholars they feel that uh, uh shenzang might be inspired by the fashian account because fashian after he finished his journey he was he became popular in china so but i mean since shenzang started 200 years after fashian and fashian was from a different geographic area and china is like you know very typically like you know uh, isolated places like you know Ostian belong to some different uh, monastic area which had different like you know language and uh, uh, things shenzhen from a different but still there are some writers they think that uh, shenzhen had this in his mind that ostian has done this but shenzhen never mentions about ostian anywhere so i mean we cannot say for sure and also knowing knowing the personality of shenzhen because he actually traveled by the land route tracing everything yeah. every king he went very very detailed and it's not just about buddhi sites he also talk about the geography the politics everything it's a complete account and he visited each place he goes there's a complete yeah, account yeah. right up to central asia like when yeah. i went to tibet or to samarkand or termes i had to go back to the accounts of sanjan what did he write about these places you know and especially in the in the along the silk road very detailed account and you know that there's a personality of sanjan he will leave no stone unturned because he was very detailed even in his translation so sometimes people find his translation a bit hard to understand because he used really classical chinese and he was very precise when he translates things he he is a man of precision uh, so so that's yeah, that's him dr v we should also mention one thing that he wrote such a detailed version detailed account despite he didn't had laptop and present the gadgets you know to record sound and to type immediately and record things he had to take out ink and everything sit for late hours and write on all those manuscripts so it was a very difficult task at during those days to write things and so you can just uh, appreciate his uh, like you know there's nothing should be missed his this thing that i mean he took so much of effort to pain and uh, trouble so we should also keep this in mind that this was a different uh, period yes maybe i should also mention about how the uh, the great uh, uh, record of the tang uh, of the western regions was written um when he met up with uh, with uh, emperor taizong emperor taizong was so impressed with him the meeting was supposed to last for 15 minutes it lasted for the whole day because taizong was interested to expand the tang empire into central asia and nobody knew much about central asia but when you hear this monk coming out with so much detail the emperor became really really interested and then after that he was so impressed with sanjang he says i want you to to be my advisor for like foreign affairs yeah. so sanjang said oh, no <laughs> no please emperor no i came back with all the scriptures i want to do translation that's my mission but how do you see no I, 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 
So that to me, I want to add one more thing. I want to add one more thing to this. You know, when Shrinzan was at to uh, Khotan, when Shrinzan was at Khotan, and he was planning to return, he was not sure how he would be taken by received by Taizong. He was not sure because he left China without his permission. So right. Shrinzan had a, another very great skill of writing, very flowery language, very good language. He was very good in writing. So he sent letter to Shrinzan Taizong. He said. That I am coming back from India, and trust me, wherever I went, so all these birds who fly from China and go to all these lands, they talk about you. That China has a, such a great king. So he had such a great way of writing, you know. So Taizong thought, "Come on, who is this guy who writes so good?" So he got, he became so eager to meet him. He said, "Come on, why you are wasting your time at Khotan? Come." So he arranged all those people at uh, uh, Kunwang. Governors were waiting for him, so they didn't give him time to rest. So he was on the horse back for more than three thousand miles from Tufan, from Khotan to uh, Tunwang, from Tunwang to Shagan, and from Shagan because at that time Taizong was at Luang. He was he was planning to attack Korea. So from the Shagan, the Luang is seven hundred kilometers. So he didn't stop. He just stepped for one night, and then next day again he went there uh, to meet uh, Taizong because Taizong was very eager to meet him. And again, as you <laughs> said, the meeting only for 15 minutes. And this uh, this uh, general he was getting uh, like you know impatient. What is going on? Why this meeting is not ending? So after like you know hour or two hours, after four five hours, he just lost patience and he went inside. And he said, "So King said, 'Come on, get out. Let us finish the talk.' And this talk, which was meant for 15 minutes is lasted hours, and <laughs> outside the army was waiting for the command. When should we attack? And this guy was talking with Swens, and you can just understand. I mean, just imagine how good talker he was, how interesting things he would must be talking. That Swens and the Taizong, who was not in, at that time, he got so much involved that he, though the military was waiting outside, but he didn't bother about that. He was just interested in talk by Swens. So Sun Zhang was very good in talking, also. Yeah, and it took Sun Zhang 14 months to write this this record, which he presented to the emperor. <laughs> and this this yeah. actually became the record for all of us. Thank goodness, because because he had to turn down the emperor in com as compensation. He promised the emperor that he write a record of what he saw, and it took him 14 months to complete it. <laughs> and now this is this is a record for all of us. Yeah, there's a question here. Uh, okay, uh, Arun Kumar, have you seen and noticed some new thing uh, which is not mentioned by Cunningham? That means mentioned by yeah, Sansa. Uh, and... Yes, Cunningham. I mean, uh, Cunningham. Um, he was uh, again like you know, Cunningham was uh, uh, an old person when he got this travel accounts of Sansa. So he was in very hurry. So uh, if you see the maps of. Uh, The archaeological sites uh, prepared by Cunningham. So many of these maps are now corrected by later explorers. So like the Shavasti map of Shavasti, archaeological remains of Shavasti. So when I was going through the map of uh, Cunningham and then later corrected by Vogel, and recently Archaeological Survey of India has come out with this map. So there's lots of difference. Cunningham didn't notice many things because at the time of Cunningham it was dense jungle everywhere. So noticing archaeological remains was difficult even for Cunningham because it was dense forest. Sarvasti was all forest. Even you know when they tried to employ few people to make excavation at Sahet and Mahet, so people said that we uh, these are haunted places and we should not come here because uh, even when they would say that we will pay you extra money, they would say no, no because it's a haunted place. It was all forest. So the recent maps prepared by Archaeological Survey of India are more updated. And you will find more observations of archaeological remains around Shavasti in these maps. So I'm taking help of uh, Cunningham's map also and map latest map of uh, archaeological survey of India. But the point is, most of these sites are totally neglected. They are lying in the middle of the field. I, I have made the pictures. I will put in my blog, and uh, they are being like you know destroyed by their agriculture farmers because they do not know the significance of all these places. So uh, task is very huge because. We might lose all these mounds if not taken care of in the next five to ten years. Okay, uh, Deepak, I think uh, um, that uh, just one last comment uh, before we close. It is so uh, interesting, actually. We can actually go on. This comes from uh, Brother Damendra uh, Kumar, who says that I hope you are documenting 
all your findings, this will be, this will be a jam. Uh, that's a comment. <laughs> right. So, uh, 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 <laughs> I'm trying to document uh, whatever. Uh, there, there's so many things which cannot be documented. You see things, but you cannot document everything. So the idea is to document as much as possible. But basically, the idea is to educate local people. When I'm going to these mounds, I'm also talking to the local farmers and telling them the, how important these places are. So I'm hoping that this might help. I'm also interacting with local monks wherever I'm going. Like I, at Shavasti, I'm staying with uh, uh, one Indian monk, and I'm trying to work with him how he can play an important role in educating people. I did similar thing at uh, Shug. I did similar thing at Shravasti. Idea is to educate local people. I mean, Archaeological Survey of India cannot protect every single mound because these mounds are scattered in a large geographic area. Okay, and there is also another comment from uh, from Marie Tunga, which is now I realize how far the distance uh, Master Swancha travel by foot. And you uh, also more than 750 kilometers. So other, so other, so other. Uh, Marie, I also had the impression <laughs> when I saw the map, how much the Buddha walked. The Buddha walked yeah. 45 <laughs> years across, across this, this uh, terrain. How, how far yeah. did the Buddha walk? In the same manner as Xuan Zhang. Xuan Zhang, wow, even fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so we have actually, um, I think, uh, come to the end of our talk. But first of all, I think uh, we must really thank Deepak Anand for giving us a very interesting presentation and discussion. And this is this work is ongoing, and he has been so inspired by the work of uh, Ben Swanzang. And uh, and um, you could actually see the 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 the, the precision that Swanzang puts into his, his his work. And because of that, uh, it is possible for us to revitalize the Buddhist site. Right, and uh, uh, actually, uh, Deepak has come up with some very good maps uh, that we have not actually seen before. You know, tracing the route of Suanjang, and uh, certainly this will expand the scope of Buddhist pilgrimage. Very often, when we think about Buddhist pilgrimage, it is like four, four plus four or four plus three normally. But if you uh, were to go on this kind of walking tours, you can actually expand. You can actually spend more time in India wandering, following the routes of Suanjang. This is part of the walking tour. Uh, that uh, Deepak is actually about. And uh, yes, many of these places have actually been the neglected for 700 years when Buddhism completely dis disappeared from, uh, from India. So you could imagine that many of these places are really left abandoned or villages have gone on them and it will be tremendous work. Uh, I think what we should do is just to focus on the most important, the most important places because if you travel in India, even if you dig the ground, you might find some remnants of some old monasteries. This is when Buddhism was flourishing. Even the state of Bihar itself, the name from Bihar comes from the word Bihara. When during the when Buddhism was yeah, flourishing, right. as you go around Bihar, as you dig on the ground in the villages and all that, you stumble on some monasteries. You know, so India is so rich with all these findings. So um, like what Deepak did mention that if you really want certain places to to uh, for the Indian, uh, uh, the, the, the ASI to, uh, to do excavation, the Buddhists themselves should begin to pay more attention. Then the Indian government could actually respond. And certainly this uh, evening talk, we talk about the passion about the, uh, of, of, uh, of, you know, how uh, this is almost a passion for, for pilgrimage, yeah? And the enthusiasm that we really have and, uh, you know, the, the thing that we can bring in. And certainly because Deepak is actually talking about his work, uh, he, one day he was asking me, how could I help to promote this work? Then I thought that if Deepak can actually give us a talk, because now it linked it with technology, he might be in Shravasti. But by telling us about your work, Deepak, it really, uh, you know, makes us very keen to follow about your, your tour and also uh, give us a completely different perspective now on how we can make use of Sun Chang's work so that we can uncover places of, of, of a Buddhist heritage, places linked up with India, right? So with that, um, I think uh, I'd like to really thank Deepak for uh, giving us time and giving us such an interesting presentation. And for all of you for coming and joining us into, in, the, in this talk this evening. So I'd like to thank you. And I'd like to, on behalf of the Buddhist Jan Fellowship, we'd like to thank uh, Brother Deepak. Uh, this time around, uh, Deepak, we don't have to fly you from India to, cook, to KL to talk to us. <laughs> it's just by making Zoom that we can actually be able to benefit from your own experience. Eh? And brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, uh, wherever you are, if you have come and join us in this kind of talk, I hope you become 
inspired. And if you have not gone for pilgrimage, one day you have to make a trip to pilgrimage. Not once, but maybe a couple of times, maybe many, many times there yeah, uh, to do your pilgrimage. And with that, I would like to wish all of you good health and peace. May uh, you continue to grow in your wisdom and compassion and in your practice of the Buddha Dharma. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
no other refuge do I seek, and no other will there be. The Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha are my only refuge.